Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way. I want to jump over the pack and here he comes. Oh, Ryan! This is Buddy Franklin! This is the greatest showman! Got the handball off to Myers. Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Randall Dazzle Rioli. Oh, who else? McDonald. Tim From inside the centre square. Hello and welcome to episode 140 of Americans Watching the Footy. No good time of day? Nope, we're cutting right to it. I'm Ethan Castle. I'm Benjamin Castle. This is our grand final preview. I'm going to open this episode with a question. Since it's episode number 140, was Twitter better with 140 characters or is it better with 280? Not talking about any other changes to the platform, just 140 versus 280. 140 because, like, the most you could put in the tweet is something like, Scarlett Johansson, I will drink your bath water. Hashtag random. Okay, that is acceptable. My conclusion isn't so much that it's better or worse. I think, like, from a news standpoint, it's definitely better with 280, but, you know, it was great with 140. Like, you really had to work for banger tweets. Like, to say some really funny shit, you had to work for it. Like, my bookmarks are mostly just banger tweets. And a lot of those were definitely from the 140 era. Is one of them the Kevin Durant one that I mentioned? Uh, no, but some of the Shaq tweets, like, you know, I'm at Knott's Berry Farm and my butt's too big to fit in the seats on the ride. Ah, that's me yelling. Uh, the famous Michael Irvin, man, when we played in that cold weather, we was cold. Uh, the Chargers tweeting about P.F. Chang's, of course. They've actually, like, referenced that in other years, though, doing, like, a happy anniversary to that. Oh, I know. Um, let's see. If something racist happens to me, don't tag Sean King. But yeah, that's that's my main 140 versus 280 take. Uh, I guess we're going to start off by talking a little bit about Brownlow Night. Uh, I mean, we might as well. That's that's what you have listed first, so I guess we'll just go with that. I mean, that happened right after we recorded our previous episode, the uh, prelims recap. And congratulations to two-time Brownlow medalist Lockie Neal. I want to think the right guy won, but I'm not sure, and seems like most footy fans are saying that's not the case at all. However, the AFL.com.au tracker did have Neil winning, and honestly, both of the top two got lucky at times. Neil was lucky to pull at all, let alone get best on ground round six at the Giants in Canberra. But Bontempelli was also lucky to get three in the final round at Geelong to even past Nick Dacos. Here's the thing. I'm, you know, we did not crack this in full, so it will be hard for us to really say who should have won. But if I was just going off of like a typical MVP vote instead of, you know, awarding stuff by game, I just would have very quickly given it to Bond and Pelly. And I mean, he did win the Lee Matthews Award, so it makes sense. I'm wondering why more stock isn't taken in that as opposed to the Brownlow. Is it just because the Brownlow ceremony has gone on for longer and it's you know had all the kind of pageantry built up into it yeah i think it's it's a whole tradition thing the pageant who will be this is me from the The thing is though i thought the pageant was made in america it's in america it wasn't made there though doesn't say the pageant is in america so it got me thinking because People were upset about a lot of the votes, and I think it was some of the more down-ballot stuff that was insane. For example, Patrick Cripps getting 22 votes this season, uh, Rowan Marshall getting three for the entire year. I mean, we know it's a midfield-heavy award, and I mean, are midfielders, kind of. Not in that same sense. I mean, the only ruck that I've really seen pulling high in our first four years watching was Max Gaughan. Uh, Tim English at times. Not to that extent of gone though, uh couple years ago but continuing on this track with uh the demons though jack viney had seven best on ground games that tied him with Lockie neal nick Dacos, and zach butters for the most 
We were considering how he played later in the year. That honestly doesn't surprise me. When Clayton Oliver was out and he was their main contested guy, yes. Um, you know, I thought that Zach Butters couldn't win because Connor Rosie would take too many votes away from him. I did not think the same about Petraka because of Viney, and I guess I should have. But this whole thing got me thinking because there were some other things besides, you know, Cripps getting 22 and Marshall getting three. It took Tom Atkins 101 games to get a vote. Grind didn't get any votes for his performance in this 100th game against Essendon. He, he did get two against Port a few weeks later, but he should have gotten results in the Essendon game. So next year, we are planning on giving out our own votes and doing, I think we're going to call it America's Brownlow Night. Originally, I was thinking of calling it the People's Brownlow, but that sounded way too communist. Either that or giving off like the Rock, the People's Champion vibes. Nah, just added to communist. I would love to get like the rest of our All-American Fantasy League in on this. I mean, we'll be the ones in charge of the actual votes, but I think we can get other people involved, make it a whole live-streamed event where we'd probably just do it from a garage. It needs to be like the, um, you know, when the South Park Comedy Awards, you know, we're in charge of the music and everything, except we won't have, we probably won't have Timmy and the Lords of the Underworld. It'll be just like, Benjamin's talking, and then two seconds later, he's playing trombone to introduce something. <laughs> and we will send an actual award to, to, like, the footy club care of whoever, to whoever wins it. But, like the Mitch Robinson medal? Yeah. I do have one thing I'm not sure about. I think the, we should probably just do it as, you know, 3-2-1 every game. But, you know, sometimes we talk about how neither team deserves four points out of a game, or... You know, both teams deserve points out of a game. So I'm not sure. I think still the 3-2-1 format. Let's, I think the, the way to test this is to go back and watch like a really terrible game, like the first game between North and St. Kilda and figure out, are there three players worthy of votes? That'll be a project for early in the off season for sure. Maybe as soon as next week. I am not watching that game again, though. So I, I was thinking... So even someone rewatch that game and like write a whole report about it would be a really good punishment for finishing last in a fantasy league. I don't know if Australians have taken on the American tradition of, you know, humiliating punishments for last place in fantasy leagues. Um, there, there are a few, you know, the typical ones like, you know, you got to go on a date with a giant stuffed animal or you got to walk around wearing a shirt. What was the really good one that you came up with? Or was that not you? Um, on another podcast, one that was suggested... For finishing last in the fantasy baseball league, it was suggested on Baseball Barbacast, was you have to propose to three different people on the scoreboard over the course of three consecutive games. I liked that. And they have to have no idea, right? I'm not... No, that part wasn't discussed. Um, One common one for fantasy football is you go to, like, either IHOP or Waffle House or some other sort of breakfast place. You have to be there for 24 hours, but each waffle you eat takes off an hour. So it has to add up to 24 hours in waffles. Um, the one I came up with that I really want to push for my fantasy league is whoever finishes in last place has to spend an entire week wearing a t-shirt that says porn kills love, which actually has to do with baseball. Yes, it does. I th This has to do with uh, Adam LaRoche, who played not just Adam LaRoche, but yes, there was a photo of Adam LaRoche's son standing on the field wearing that shirt. And then also it was, it's sold by the organization that the Kansas City Royals once brought in to lecture their team about the evils of pornography. I mean, yeah, Adam LaRoche was a journeyman who I guess had his greatest success late in, the, late in his career with the Nationals. Yeah, but there was a whole thing with the White Sox and his son and like that basic divisive thing over should he be, you know, his kid is in the clubhouse too much. His kid isn't in the clubhouse enough. Ended up leading to his retirement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. The whole thing is really funny. That shirt is the one I'd go with. If you have any good ideas for like last place stuff, please let me know. Also, there's been a hashtag trending for this Japanese thing. I guess it's manga. Uh, JJK and then the episode number stands for Jujutsu Kaisen, but I'd like to pretend it's got it's about Josh J. Kennedy. D just involving like how many stutter steps he has in his run up to the goal. I don't know. I just like the idea of a bunch of Japanese people tweeting about Josh J. Kennedy. I would like that a lot. It's Josh P. Kennedy, though, who is going to be the uh, Premiership Cup ambassador. So we, we have all the details about that, um, and we'll get into that as we get into our grand final preview in a bit. 
want to recap some of the other awards that were handed out on Monday. I was very pleased with both of the results. Harry Himmelberg did win Mark of the Year for round one, and I thought it was going to be Dan Houston with the set shot from 55 in the rain. Thankfully, it was Will Ashcroft who won the goal of the year, basically doing the Daniel Wells, Jackie Chan, but on the inside of the boot and on the boundary. That's like an all-time great goal of the year, honestly. What people criticized it for, though, was like saying he didn't mean to do that. Okay. Like, how much do you value intent over the fact that it actually fucking happened regardless? Now, if you say, yeah, my response to, you know, he, but he didn't mean to do it is just going to be okay. What I would say is, you try to do it. We got the right winners for both of those. We will definitely, for America's Brownlow Night next year, be doing our own, which hopefully will end up being the same winners. It was this year for us. It wasn't the same nominees, but it was the same winners. Yeah. Um. Who else did we have in there? I forget who our other Mark nominee was because it wasn't that great of a crop this year. It could have just ended up being the two from Himmelberg and that's it. I don't know. I This year, as good as it was on the goal front, was a bit down on the Mark front. My other two nominees for goal wouldn't have been Dan Houston, and I'm not sure if it would have been Paul Curtis, because he had the Charlie Cameron one-timer and the Brody Majacek bicycle. Yeah, the one with uh, Nick Blakey pulling him down. I believe those all occurred in consecutive rounds, six, seven, and eight. But yeah, we had a lot of good choices this year. That's that's the best part of this, is there were a lot of good choices. And I look forward to fleshing out how exactly we're going to handle the concept of America's Brown Low Night moving forward, because... Yeah, I've got a few ideas, but we'll have to figure out more. Um, I definitely want to pace it better because my biggest critique of the actual TV event, Brownlow Night, as fun as it is, is just how many times they ended up going to breaks like after two or three rounds. And not just that. Well, the awards were so oddly paced. The other awards throughout the night. It was the way it was spread out where they did both goal and mark of the year kind of back to back super early. And they did the Jim Stice Community Award super early, which went to Sam Doherty for his work with cancer research and children's charities. And then at the end, they kind of just rush it across the finish line when it should be. Get a bunch of the early rounds in and then do some awards and kind of slow it down to build up suspense instead of go slowly and then try to like make up for lost time at the end. So that's, yeah, I would have said the issue. I would have said like, do something where you get close to halfway before you do the other awards to help build up the drama. I would do more than halfway. But we'll get to do our own version of this, and I think it'll be shorter. I can't imagine it will be much more than an hour at most. But I definitely want to have some fun with this and make it an event. I think the night after Brown Low Night is going to be the best time to do it. So we can kind of, like, go back and compare. That would be good. Um, I, I think the other big question, though, is how are we going to get other people involved? And what kind of video editing will I have to do beforehand? I don't know. We'll make it, hopefully, pretty minimal. Uh, well, considering we'll, I'll have, we'll have to do like the round montages and stuff. You don't have to do that. We'll just, we'll just make sure that our main character for each round gets represented. Speaking of which, we had a very good, uh, pulse on this season because our main character was pretty reliably in the round montages. Let's see, how many did we have? We had out of the 24, 25 because we had co-main characters for round 20. Oh, right. Uh, but uh, we considered 15 of them to have made it in. There were a couple that I'm surprised weren't in there. Now, Jack Gunston wasn't really in there, but he did get some recognition like when the votes were given out as kind of a nod to his father as well. And uh, I'm surprised that Harrison Petty wasn't really recognized when they talked about Brown 20. Like they showed like in the montage, you saw like a second of him, but he wasn't referenced directly. And the one that really pissed me off for not being included was for round five, the Gather round. Mr. All Teams Should Merge. Like, how did that guy not get, like, a half-second clip? Especially roll. He was so good. Especially considering it ended up being a guy from a team that merged who won the Brownlow, which would have made it all the more fitting in hindsight. Nobody knew that it would have made that correlation. He was hysterical. And there were a couple non-human main characters that did find their way in of course the gavel lights in round two and the number 76 in round 10 so we're gonna keep tracking this stuff with uh main characters and how often they appear in various montages i think of course none of them will appear in the montage which i guess 
No, we actually have a lot more chances to see it with AFL women sometimes being on FS2. Aha. I just found the exact clip. He was shown second quarter of Geelong beating the crap out of West Coast. Mr. All Teams Should Merge? Yes. That guy knew what he was doing. Is he our fan of the year? Oh, yeah. He might be our fan of forever. Again, I want to find out who this guy is because we need to make him the official mascot of the Gather Round and get him on the show if possible. Yes, we need to get him. We need to get Jake Rippon. We need to get Phil Cox. And obviously, we'll get some of our other podcast friends and other people on in the off season as well. I've got a couple others in mind. Uh, we also do have some list things that I guess we could fit under the umbrella of news, everyone. Wow, that sounded really accurate. Uh, you know what? I'll play the clip anyway. Nobody can actually do a good Farnsworth voice. News, everyone. You know who really can't is Uncle Al, who is otherwise one of the best people on YouTube. Yeah, like there are two voices that he does poorly that we know of. The Professor and SpongeBob. We're not going to get Billy West to like send us a clip of it. We're just going to use that old soundbite. Carrington's Lockheed Plowman is retiring at the ripe old age of 29, an ancient relic. And it seemed like Blues fans didn't take too kindly to the club paying tribute to him. He played 145 games, got into one this year, was actually in the Gather round. where they got blown the fuck out by Adelaide to start that losing streak. I see nothing wrong with paying tribute to a retiring player. And oh, yeah, even if he wasn't with you for that long, I'm, I'm totally in favor of... I mean, he happened to be on their list for eight years. Yeah, why wouldn't you? What, what seems to be the issue here? Like, even if he sucked at the end or something. Even if he was on a list that didn't make a final for a decade. I don't get it at all, but Carlton had to lock the replies. Shit. Yeah. What, what did he do? Or you know what? I think it was locked before any replies were made. Is that the case? I, I don't know, but let's see. Let's see what the quote tweets are. Uh, they're, they seem to be positive. People are just like asking, why did they turn off the replies? You know what? I bet the replies that were sent before were hidden, and because it's locked, they're not accessible. No, hidden replies are... Even if things are locked, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. It's, it's weird. This is very weird. Is it as weird as North delisting Flynn Perez, who was... Was that... I think that may have been my sleeper pick. Yeah, him and Phoenix Spicer surprised me. Lockie Young and Jacob Edwards less so. Uh, Spicer, I could understand. Not able to get consistent time and group of factors that led to that. Kind of undersized, not able to stand out in a sort of Kazi Piggott type of way that I think the club envisioned for him. Uh, but I had thought that with Ben McKay gone, Perez would be playing a more important role in the back line. I think part of it might be them backing in Josh Goder to have some of that role. And maybe he'll be my sleeper next year because he didn't get as much time this past season because of injuries. Also, Jacob Edwards, number one pick in the midseason draft in 2021, didn't get a game. Who was the number two pick in that draft, Ethan? Uh, you told me yesterday, and I can't remember. Jai Newcomb. Swing and a miss. Let's look at some of the other picks from that midseason draft. Uh, well, picks two through five have all made it to the AFL, because Ash Johnson was third, Patrick Parnell, who you really like, was fourth, Ned Moyle was fifth, grand final sprint entry Ned Moyle. You know what, if Damian Hardwick's sons are going to be like this, and the expansion teams are just going to be all for the memes, I'm in for the ride. I am just here for joke entries for the grand final sprint in any situation. It's uh, Jackson Pryor and Josh Carmichael for Brisbane and Collingwood, respectively. Unsurprisingly, I don't think either of them are listed as an emergency. Yeah, you're not throwing in someone who could, you know, where like them pulling a hamstring or something could hurt you. Yeah. Looking back at this 2021 midseason draft, I actually recognize a whole lot of the names in here. This was a pretty likely midseason draft, too, looking at it. Yeah, let's see. Who else has gotten games from this group? Uh, James Peatling for the Giants. Sam Durham, kind of important. Lachlan McAndrew, I think he's been in very briefly. Yeah, uh, McEntee. McEntee, yeah, although, I mean, don't think he should have gotten as many games as he's gotten this year because Frank Evans. Matthew Parker for Richmond was there briefly before going back home to the West for family reasons. Oh, he's doing well. Aiden Begg, Cooper Sharman down at 21, one pick after Jordan Boyd. Connor West and Daniel Turner. Yes, yeah, this is... I think Connor West was uh, delisted by the Eagles, but Disco's gotten the games for the Demons. 
Bag has really slid down the charts at Collingwood. I would not be surprised to see him being delisted after this season. I guess there was no midseason draft in 2020. No, there was not. Let's see how... Uh, God, these are fun to look at. Let's see, 2019 looks... Well, Tika Masala was six. Uh, Marlon Pickett, 13. John Noble, 14. Uh, Yeah, one of those was kind of important. Actually, I mean, Noble, damn good pickup at 14. I think he played every possible game before this finals run, of which he's played zero. But yeah, that was a very lengthy midseason draft in 2019. Was there a midseason draft in 2018? I think 2019 was when it was brought... And I think 2019 was when it was brought back in the first place. I I think these are more fun to look back at than like, the national draft and the rugby draft. I think this is way more fun. Really? Why? Just because it's shorter? I think that and because some of them are such instant impact. I mean, some guys get picked up in the midseason draft and then make their debut, what is it, 10 days later? Yeah, we saw that this year. Ryan Merrick. Uh, Massimo D'Ambrosio has requested a move to Hawthorne. So interesting stuff in the rivalry there. He was the sub a number of times this year and swung forward to kick the winner in the one goal game against North. How many games did he play this year, D'Ambrosio? I actually have to put in AFL tables because like, otherwise it's just various D'Ambrosio or Ambrosio companies that actually make fucking tables that show up. Uh, okay, that's funny. He was subbed out round nine, and then for his final four games of the year, rounds 10 through 13, he was the sub himself. Wait, he only played one more game after getting the winner against North? Yeah, I, I don't get it. Essen did have no shortage of running defenders, so I get why he wants a move, and I just thought he was a better option than a lot of the guys they've gotten with. Yeah. He's 20 years old now, can join that young group at Hawthorne. We'll see what the kind of return they get from him is. Also, you've heard about like Essendon and St. Kilda trying to kind of find a loophole in the trade protocol to maybe work out something for a Jade Gresham deal. Yeah, something involving like sending people back and forth, basically. Sending picks back and forth, I think. Not sure if the, the commission has to prove that or whatever. I don't think this, though, will be nearly as controversial as David Stern deciding to turn down the Chris Paul to Lakers trade. Oh, no, I was thinking about the back and forth with this as kind of being like the um, like that problem. You know, you have to get the fox, the chicken and the corn across the river, but you can't leave the fox with the corn and you can't leave the chicken with the fox. Is it corn? It's it's usually something like that. And basically the it's the wolf, the goat and the cabbage. OK, it, I've heard it was a bunch of different things. Anyway, the point is. You put the predator and the vegetable, whatever, the you know, whether it's a fox and a wolf or whatever, you keep those together because you can't leave the chicken with the other two. It's, it's pretty simple when you when it runs down to that. Um, One last thing. Do AFL contracts need a no wrestling clause? I'm sorry, this is all too fucking funny that this happened and I can't even, I can't, you know, this is like play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And I thought, oh, the Swans are due for some breaks. They were pretty unlucky this year. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is really a break because it's just, well, first off, it's not a break. It's presumably a tear. Second, it's so fucking stupid. Third, you knew it had to be a Mad Monday thing. And I'm surprised that we don't see more Mad Monday injuries. I mean, the only time we'd really talked about stupid shit happening on Mad Monday was like, that club that got relegated, like, doing weird things to each other. I think that was last year. It was some local club. Yeah, they got relegated and still had, like, a Mad Monday for the ages. The Sydney Swans did not... I mean, they got relegated from Grand Final Loser to uh, Elimination Final Loser. But this isn't, like, a whole team thing. It's Callum Mills wrestling with 2022 first-round pick Jacob Constanti and ending up needing rotator cuff surgery which puts a baseball pitcher out of action for about a year and may do the same to him for footy. I know Kane Corns was all over this saying that he shouldn't even be paid his contract for next year and his captaincy should be taken away. Thoughts on any of that, whether it comes to you know, guaranteed money or club leadership? I don't know. It's it's not a very captainly thing to do, though. This honestly might be a great time to start pushing the club leadership toward a younger part of the list, though particularly getting Errol Golden into a leadership role, maybe even vice captain. Considering what, do they have three co-captains right now? Parker, Rampy, and Mills? 
I think it is time, though, to start looking toward a younger leadership group at the club anyway. And if, if this stupid shit is what it takes to do that, then uh, okay. What, like, baseball or hockey or just American sports injuries can you think of in this context? Like, I can think of, like, Sammy Sosa throwing out his back while sneezing and missing okay, a lot. That's, that's like, a, just an innocent mishap. Is the John Smoltz ironing story real? I don't know. There's some sort of legend going around that Hall of Fame pitcher John Smoltz, who was mostly an Atlanta Brave, hurt himself by trying to iron a shirt that he was wearing. Yeah, this is not true. There's no way. Yeah, I don't. I didn't think so. Um, like, He's actually been interviewed about it and said, no, he, he didn't. But he did burn himself because he had set the steamer down and then water popped out and caught him on the chest. So that's how he burned himself. It wasn't while he was... He didn't try to iron a shirt while he was wearing it. There are a lot of just very... I feel like you hear about more dumb baseball injuries than anybody else. Like, um, Adam Eaton, not the Chicago White Sox Adam Eaton, but I guess San Diego Padres Adam Eaton, injuring himself while attempting to open the wrapping to a DVD with a knife. He stabbed himself in the stomach. And then shortly after that, he had a season ended with Tommy John surgery anyway. Uh, Everyone will, will remember today is the day that Daniel Larson saved the economy from total collapse. There's a Callum Mills one. I think this is up there with the Marty Cordova falling asleep in a tanning bed injury. Or like Plaxico Burris shooting himself. Quite literally shooting himself in the foot. I think it was in the hip. I don't think it was in the foot. One of my favorite lines in the Lil Dicky song Sports is, Shots in the club like Plaxico. Uh, it was his quad. I remember, I think it was uh, San Francisco-born Stevie Johnson, who grew up in the East Bay, a uh, receiver for the Bills, I believe at the time, who mimed shooting himself like Plaxico after scoring against the Jets. And yeah, he got a fine for that, but it was much needed. I think then what this requires is a couple opponents in whoever plays the Swans round one or, or in the Swans first home game. A couple of their opponents need to combine for a wrestling goal celebration. Oh, yeah. I feel like there aren't a ton of coordinated goal celebrations involving multiple people. It's usually just the goal scorer himself. And, and there's usually only coordination when they're having a kid. Like the Rock and the Baby thing. We saw that with Nathan Rod. The best one of that this year was uh, Oscar McInerney doing the shark fin because his son's named Finn. That, like, actually required a tiny bit of lateral thinking. Like, I'd like to see more, you know, like the rowing the boat celebration, like from the, was it Tahiti soccer team? I forget. When I think of the rowing the boat celebration, I just think of Steve Smith Sr. during his time with the Carolina Panthers making fun of the Minnesota Vikings at a time where they were coached by our dad's friend. Yeah, it was, Tah it was Tahiti in the Confederations Cup. They scored, they got their asses kicked, but they scored and they all started it. Started doing, like, a paddle boat celebration. Question. Are players fine for, like, doing coordinated goal celebrations? Or is, like, there? I don't think so. I don't think so either. But we've seen stupider things. But uh, whoever plays the Swans round one, and we will do a whole, like, fixture release special when that happens probably sometime in November. Like, we'll probably need to name certain players who we think are likely to, to actually take that on. <laughs> You know, Benjamin, 78% of our listeners are between 18 and 35 years old, so they probably want to start a podcast like we did. How did you know that number, Ethan? Thanks to the analytics we have for Spotify for Podcasters. Formerly known as Anchor, sorry for your fans, Spotify for Podcasters has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. No fancy software needed. It's so easy you can edit it while drunk. And Spotify for Podcasters doesn't just allow you to upload to Spotify, you can also distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Stitcher, and more, just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free, you can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Hint, hint. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app, or go to podcasters.spotify.com to get started today. A reminder as we get back into things here, our socials, Twitter, and YouTube, at Americans Footy, we will be... Pretty active during the grand final, although, I mean, it may not be our normal sort of tweets because uh, we're not going to be just watching it from home. More on, just mention that in a second. I'm all, I not just mention it now. I mean, sure, yeah. Uh, we'll be at the Golden Gate Ruse watch party at Buzzworks there, post-game hangout. 
in San Francisco. Got great setup there behind the bar. Every screen will have the game on. It was a great atmosphere last year. I think there were more Sydney fans than Geelong, from what I recall. I wasn't there. I was watching at home with Brian Harambe. I will be going to this one. Yeah, maybe you'll see some photos on Benjamin HK01 and Castle Media, our respective individual accounts as well. Also, there is a new video on Brian's Instagram at cat named Brian. It's just him being him. Yeah, make sure you watch it. It's it's really good. Yeah. Um, the other thing I remember last year is that it ended up being like maybe more than half like actual native Australians who were there between expats now living in the U.S. and Australians in the tech industry who were at Dreamforce. Yeah, Dreamforce is not going on during this one uh, happen. Yeah, um, but there there are still people here for business, you know, the busy businessman. Yeah, um, thankfully the Folsom Street Fair has already happened as well. Yeah, um, it's, it's a thing. It is a thing. It is not the thing. Just like how it wasn't the Bible, apparently. It's a Bible. It's a grand final. Oh yeah, uh, don't think we ever mentioned James Jordan looks like he's going to the Sydney Swans. Didn't mention that before the break when we were talking about other things with the Swans and the Mad Monday shenanigans. Jordan's an interesting get for midfield depth. Obviously, he got some pieces there that are aging out, particularly Luke Parker. Would be really funny, though, if he just ends up going from the sub at Melbourne to the sub at Sydney with nothing in between. So, uh, I guess it's time to talk about the grand final, yeah? Yeah, this is the first first versus second grand final in nine years, which is a record. I think that says something about how the pre-finals buy has ended up helping teams lower down on the ladder. It'll be played at 2.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time on Saturday, 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 9.30 p.m. Pacific Time for us on Friday, 4.30 a.m. in Ghana. Oh, you mean like the homeland of Isaac Quainer's family? Ah, that was actually a really good coincidence. Was that just the random country you got up there? Yeah, it knew. Yeah, Quainer's family is Ghanaian, which is why he was in their Next Generation Academy. Say that's worked out for him. So yeah, Collingwood against Brisbane. Collingwood going to be wearing black shorts. Brisbane will be wearing the normal maroon tops with white shorts, which I don't think they've worn all year. I think it's a good look. I mean, I like it, but also Collingwood wearing white shorts would have just been more natural. I don't know. I think it'll be fine. It won't be hard to tell the teams apart. No. That's why I'm glad it's not Collingwood and Carlton. Firstly, because it also means the entire state of Victoria won't implode. Yeah, and we can have a good versus evil instead of an evil versus evil. I think we win regardless, though, because either it's the Lions, who we both saw as flag favorites going into the year, or Mason Cox wins. With all due respect to Mason, the thing is he's one person, and while I'd be very happy for one person, I'd rather not have the whole... Collingwood fan base, which is a lot more than one person. Sorry to all of our Collingwood listeners, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there are some cool Collingwood fans that are very self-aware and understand that everyone hates them and plays into the bit. Yeah, even even Swoop does that. Yeah, I like it. But I feel like the negative Collingwood fans, they're just like the, the ones that detract from their fan base, get more attention online than ones from any other fan base. That may just mean there are more of them, or it may just mean that people like hating on Collingwood. These teams haven't met at the G since 2017 when the Lions were terrible and Collingwood beat them by 45 then. The Lions have won the last six meetings. It's the longest head-to-head streak for a grand final matchup going into the game since 1989. And that streak held up then with Hawthorne beating Geelong. Maybe we'll see something weird though where like in 1989, a loser wins the Norm Smith. I feel like the most likely losing player to win the Norm Smith medal has to be Nick Dacos, right? I think there's a way to see either Nick Dacos or Lockie Neal win it as a loser. Now, the last time, though, that a Norm Smith medalist went to a losing player, was that Chris Judd in 2005? That would be even more fitting then because he's the one presenting the Norm Smith medal this year. I feel like if it's going to be a losing player, though, I feel like it's way more likely to be Dacos than Neal. I can't see a scenario where Brisbane loses this game but has an individual performer good enough to merit the Norm Smith. I don't know. But yeah, Judd was the last one. When the Pies and Lions met in the 0-2 grand final, Nathan Buckley actually won the Norm Smith. That actually caused them to change the voting process because beforehand they asked people for their votes partway through the fourth quarter and Michael Voss had a brilliant ending to the game 
and probably was robbed of the Norm Smith medal as a result. I've gone back and watched the 02 and 03 Grand Finals. The 02 one is one of the best Grand Finals that I've ever watched, let alone one of the best games as well. I'd say that goes up there pretty close with 2009 and 2018. I just, obviously, I really hope that Brisbane wins this, but more than anything, we are so due for a good Grand Final, even if it doesn't come, like, right down to the wire, be within a couple goals. You know, with 10 minutes left, we don't know who's going to win. I feel like that's a that's a good measure. You know, with 10 minutes left, the game's still up for grabs. We haven't had that in the time that we've been watching. I mean, there there have been a few good Grand Finals right before we had started watching. 2018, of course, uh, Free Kick Bulldogs in 2016, and then 2012, that's another one that I had a lot of fun going back and watching the Swans beating Hawthorne then. Two teams that Cats fans really don't like, I guess, huh? Or, or is it more just that the Swans meetings had so much going on in them these past couple years? I think it's that. I mean, you're more against the Swans than you are the Hawks at this point. Yeah, even that, it's kind of like taken down a little bit after what we've done to them. But my bias against them kind of comes more from like the... American view of Sydney being this amazing city and people just not knowing anywhere near as much about Melbourne. I get that. So that's, so that's a different angle as well. So it's it's hard to say. Let's take a look back at some of the things that stood out in the two meetings that they had this year. Holy Thursday round for a 33 point win for the Lions, but I think the Pies are still a chance. The before and after Cameron's Charlie Cameron Rayner combined for 10 goals in that game. That was the game where Rayner really went back into the forward group, back into forward. That sounds weird, but whatever, I'm going with it. How did he not get votes that game? Because this system is dumb. I mean, I forget what the exact count was from that game. I can look that up right now. Did Nick Dacos get votes there? Or did he not? That was like a real stat padding game for him. I actually don't think he did. It was Neil 1, Ashcroft 2, Cameron 3. Ashcroft got votes over Neil a couple times that I didn't necessarily expect, but Cameron getting three makes sense there. A different Cameron missing out after a bag was a surprise. What was the game where Jeremy Cameron, was it round two against Carlton, where he kicked six and only got one vote? Yeah, some of these were ridiculous, and it's why we need to do our own. I think it's going to end up closer to the Lee Matthews voting when we do America's Brown Low. I think it's still going to kind of be its own thing with like some guys getting like, for example, I think Jai Newcomb is going to pull ridiculously well. My other question is, are we doing the votes like right after the games, right after we watch them for the first time? Or are we like able to really go through the stats? I don't know. We'll have to hammer all of that out. Yeah, because because that can have a real factor there. Yeah, going back to that round two game, it was 29 disposal at 7 mark and no bounce Adam Sod. What? Who got the three votes? I do not remember that game enough to tell you whether or not that was right. Another thing about that Holy Thursday game, Brisbane decided to go all in with outnumbering Collinwood at contests, which was the opposite of what Melbourne did when the Pies lost their second game of the year, where they ended up outnumbering him on the wings. I think the contest outnumbering is a strategy that suits more teams and the Lions are one of those because their wings aren't a real strength of theirs. I mean, Hewa Cluggage is the closest thing to a steady wing they have, and I don't see him as that role. I see him just as a good outside mid. I have a feeling if the Lions are to win this game, McCluggage is going to have a huge day. Like Norm Smith quality day? I think so. Is he your pick for Norm Smith if the Lions win? I think so. And then for Collingwood, I'll just get that out of the way now. Picking Dacos is way too easy. Picking Dugowie is also way too easy. So I'm going to, yeah, so if you can't pick one of those two, I mean, usually a midfielder's award, but I'm going to go with Darcy Moore. I highly doubt a defender will win it. I would say if it's not one of the two that we mentioned, Jack Crisp. Jack Crisp, you know what? You can go with Crisp. I'll go with Tom Mitchell, who's had a very good final series and has pulled surprisingly well at times in the brown low as well and may have ended up costing Nick Dacos. Had a couple best on ground performances there that really did some damage there. And Mitchell will need to continue stepping up in the continued absence of Taylor Adams. As for the round 23 meeting, it was a high scoring affair, Brisbane winning by 24 because if you play three miles away from a place where they can't win, they're like unstoppable. Remember their banner? Our thoughts are with the pies tonight. The G to Marvel is quite the flight. 
I really hope Collingwood's banner for the grand final makes fun of how Brisbane can only win at Marvel and not the G. Except for finals, I guess. Except for a final. It's a final. Because they came back there a week later and kind of got their shit slapped. Well, they had expended a lot of energy there to win the prior week. Exactly, yes. Which is maybe a fear about Collingwood? Yeah, I think that would probably be the bigger concern for Collingwood. I mean, you could... Like, it's not an exact parallel to last year, because last year you had one team that was coming off a blowout and one team coming off a one-point game. This time, they're both coming off close games, one just closer than the other. The turnover margin was not huge in that round 23 meeting. It was only 58 to 54, Collingwood committing four more. But the Lions were so effective at rebounding and transitioning from turnovers that that was where they did most of their damage. It was one of those games where just like, holy crap, their midfield and forward groups are so good that they can win games just on sheer talent at those two spots alone. At the same time, last week, they couldn't play that same front half game for... I'd say it was more of a full oval game in general, and they stood up when they needed to. Actually, you know what? I can think of somebody else who could win the Norm Smith if it's not McCluggage for the Lions. Harris Andrews? I think he's the most likely defender to win it, but no. Who tends to go off against Collingwood? Charlie Cameron? Yeah, how about kicking 17 goals won in their last four meetings? Hang on. He kicked six on Holy Thursday, another four in round 23. But yeah, the transitions... Cameron with another big game. That's not what people remember this round 23 meeting for. People remember it for Devin Robertson getting his jumper ripped off. He gained 30,000 Instagram followers in, I guess, about three days, considering when we recorded our recap to that. He has gained another 50,000 since. He went from 11.1K before that game to 91.4K in less than six weeks. Uh, Mason Cox talked about getting his jumper ripped during his episode that just came out the other day, and it wasn't the same. He was like, I don't think people want to see my nipples. The the whole thing was funny. And it, it was talk about kind of like the thing where, you know, he had to come off. And I think part of that was like trying to avoid any more altercations between players. But I mean, that's a very Mason thing. You kick a goal and then you rough up the player on the mark. He was probably coming off anyway, for the record. Why does that happen after you kick a goal? It feels like a momentum killer. I mean, you get a chance to like give the player an ovation if they've been having a good run, but I've always found that to be very weird that after they kick a goal is when they go off. Like even in hockey, you usually see that same line stay out for the next shift, right? Not necessarily. It depends on how long the shift has been. I think it might be more often though than footy players kicking a goal. So I, I still find that very, very strange. I mentioned those couple grand final meetings, the the great one in 2002. The 03 grand final was actually their most recent finals meeting. And Simon Black won the Norm Smith medal with a grand final record 39 disposals. That was tied two years ago by Christian Petraka, who also won the Norm Smith. The Lions became the first club to three-peat in nearly half a century, and it's only been done once since. It is amazing, just the list of big-time people from that Lions team. I know we've talked about this before. Jason Ackermanis kicked five goals in that game. He was the leading scorer. You had the 01 and 02 Brownlow medalists in Ackermanis and Black. You had Voss as the captain. Here, let me just run through a quick list. Um, wait, let me just cut to the chase. Craig McRae. I only really see three recognizable names from Collingwood. Uh, Leon Davis, Nathan Buckley, Shane Wawoden. I think that just kind of shows our recency bias there. Yeah. And then I, I I recognize actually like way more of these guys. Reese Shaw was the head coach at North for a bit. That's how I know his name. Chris Tarrant took a really good mark, which I think is the basis for the Mark of the Year logo, even though he lost Mark of the Year that year to probably the greatest mark of all time, Gary Moorcroft. By the way, I think that when we do our Mark of the Year and Goal of the Year, we'll probably name the Mark of the Year one the Gary Moorcroft medal. You think that's right? I don't know. I guess. Goal of the Year will definitely be the Eddie Betts medal. Looking at this Brisbane list, it's amazing how many of these people have either become coaches or influential media figures. Just running through real quick. Justin Lepich, Nigel Lappin, Jason Ackermanis, Michael Voss, Jonathan Brown, Alistair Lynch, Craig McRae, Simon Black, Marcus Ashcroft. That is a ridiculous number of people who have stayed involved in the game that were on the same team. And how about two of them coaching against the Lions this week in McRae and Lepich? 
I recognize a few other names from these lists. Um, Nigel Lappin, a player that probably doesn't get enough respect from those teams at, at least kind of 20 years on for the Lions. Blake Carousella is an assistant at Essendon. He had come over to the Lions pretty recently before that. He was uh, one of the caretakers that won last year, I believe, standing in for Ben Rutten. On Collingwood's side, Didak, um, Simon Preston Giacomo. He's the reason why it had been a tradition for the first Collingwood draftee each year to wear number 35, because he pretty selflessly ruled himself out of the grand final replay in 2010. And I think they had him raise the flag after that as a result. Jason Cloak also, I mean, the Cloak brothers all notable in their own rights. It was so much fun going back and watching these games. And also, you know, the coaches, both huge names and Lee Matthews and Mick Malthouse. Matthews will be the Alliance Premiership Cup presenter if they win. If Colin would win, it will be Peter Moore, which will be just another amazing moment, him and being able to hand that over to his son. But the fact that so many of these names are recognizable to us 20 years on is pretty remarkable. Like at the time of this 2003 grand final, I mean, I definitely knew Australia existed. I was seven. I'm not sure if this aired anywhere in the United States that was on, you know, regular cable. When was the first time you'd even heard of Australian rules football? I don't know. Probably within the next few years of that. Wouldn't have been able to tell you anything about it other than that it existed. And at that point, the Eagles were actually good. No surprising list changes for Collingwood. Billy Frampton in for Dan McStay. That was known early in the week. Jack Ginnivan into the 22 with Pat Lipinski demoted to the sub. I don't find that surprising at all. Collingwood fans have been calling for Lipinski's demotion for a while. He'd been inconsistent and a bit more turnover prone as of late than Ginevan had. And I'm, I'm glad to see Ginevan get the shot in the 22. I'm surprised, though, that it was Lipinski coming up instead of, I don't know, Will Hoskin Elliott or something. I feel like Lipinski, I mean, I think he's a good sub pick because he's someone you can shift other pieces around with. But I feel like he's still, even though if he's been slumping a bit, I think he'd still be in your best 22. I think Hoskin Elliott can do a better job matching up against some of the forwards. He's a bit bigger. I will say this. If Hoskin Elliott plays well, I can't see any way Colin would lose. Frampton definitely a downgrade from McStay. This is actually going to be his first final period in the AFL. I don't think you're going to get that obsessed over like it being Dangerfield's first ever grand final at any, at any level in 2020. That was constantly in the commentary back then. Like, I remember making, like, a, a grand final bingo thing with, like, things that would happen or things commentators would say. That was definitely on there. Ooh, should we come up with a bingo thing, or is it a little late to do that? I think it might be a little late. So I've also got to finish with my trombone stuff with the uh, the renditions of the club songs like I've done each year. And I actually have to record two new ones entirely this year. And the four years we've watched, I guess we've had seven different grand finalists. I really do like the inclusion of Ginevan. I think the combination of him and Bobby Hill creates so much havoc, and I think it'll really put Brisbane's smaller defenders to the test. Like, Brandon Starcevich is really going to have to stand up. On the ground as opposed to in the air. Like, Kadeen Coleman, if it's something in the air, I'll back him at every time. When it's a ground-based game, I'm not nearly as confident in his abilities. And he was probably their best in the prelim because of the Blues just going through the air more. Throughout the week, the watch for the Lions was, will Jack Payne be good to go? And he is, but... He's not? This doesn't make much sense to me. Like, I feel like if you're choosing out of the trio of Gardner, Lester, and Payne... Payne would have to be one of the three. I, I guess. I was trying to think of what's their reasoning here beyond just he missed a game and might be rusty. And all I can think of is, you know, other than Majacek, you don't really have, like, too many big one-on-one -on -one marking contests that you're going to go up against because this Collingwood team without McStay maybe doesn't have that sort of matchup. Unless it happens to be Frampton or Cox. Or, or Hoskin Elliott, I guess. Cameron. A little bit of that. Darcy Cameron, a, a but, chance. But, but there's no one guy that you keep going to in those. Yeah, and Gardner's, so, and Gardner's definitely more of a mobile defender. So that I guess that does kind of lean towards, you know, playing a little bit smaller instead of, you know, locking into one-on-one -on -one matchups, playing towards mobility. But I still think Payne is too good to the point where if he is at 100% or close to it, I think you got to have him in there. So then do you expect him to be the sub over Jared Lyons? No, I do think Lyons is going to be the sub because he's the more versatile player. You know, what happens if someone gets hurt? Someone pulls a hamstring early. You're much more comfortable bringing Lyons in because, like, you know, what if it's a forward that gets hurt? You can, you can throw Lyons in. You, you bring in the most versatile player. I'd be very surprised if he's not the sub. Jared Lyons could pull off the craziest double of all. 
the J.J. Liston, and the Norm Smith. I don't think anybody's won the VFL Best and Fairest and then went on to win the uh, Norm Smith as well. Winning the Norm Smith as a sub would be, first off, someone would have to get hurt really early. Second, just, it, it would be an incredible story. I feel like a lot has to happen for that to work. I mean, we've had some double VFL and AFL Premiership players. For example, who won the Norm Goss medal as best on ground in the VFL Grand Final in 2019? Uh, uh, I don't know. Marlon Pickett. Oh, okay. That was why he was the easy inclusion there in 2019. Actually, the the Norm Goss Memorial Medal this year went to a losing player, Sean Mana, for Werribee because he kicked six. And I would not be surprised if he's a mature age addition to an AFL list next year. Is the one-on-one -on -one matchup then... I mean, I, I guess he'd kind of restore Andrews to be more of that roving defender and having him with a direct assignment like he had on Mackay last week. Yeah, you could probably give Gardner the the first one-on-one -on -one and let Andrews roam a bit. So, Gardner to my check or Frampton that? Well, Frampton's lined up as a halfback to start. I know that doesn't mean a ton, but that would make sense. I find it far more likely for Frampton to swing forward than Jeremy Howe. And I think it would be a better sort of game plan as well. And for the record, Howe's listed in a back pocket. Yeah, your full forwards include Josh Dacos and Jordan Degoe, which just doesn't seem like it's going to stick. Neither does Oleg Markov being listed on the center line. I mean, I can get him getting some time on the wing with the run he has, but nah, I don't think that would be right. What a story Markov would be to, to win the premiership after being such a late addition to Collingwood's list as a supplemental player. We didn't think they had an opening for a while. I believe he trained with the Blues for a day and said, fuck it, I'm going to your rival. That would have been even more of a story had Carlton beaten the Lions, but uh, I think we're thankful that that didn't happen. What would the biggest story be out of this Lions team then, like individually? Would it be Gardner? Would it be Jasper Fletcher? Cal Achi maybe, because he's gotten more opportunity in the wake of Will Ashcroft's ACL? I don't know, I feel like Fletcher, just with the last name, maybe, honestly, Dane Zorko being not just his 250th game, but you know, former captain, kind of caught a lot of crap for his actions. On and off the oval. But 250 worked out for someone last year. Sure did. Actually, you know what? No, there's someone we haven't mentioned yet, and I'm surprised that we haven't. Because Connor McKenna is looking to be the fourth Irish premiership player in the AFL, and the second after Ty Canelli to win both an All-Ireland Senior Championship and an AFL premiership. I think that's it right there. Especially with him having gone back to Ireland for a couple of years, like Ty Canelli did to win the senior championship with Kerry in 2009, I think. That said, having two Irish players on last year's team kind of takes the wind out of the sails a little bit. I mean, I guess it's still pretty cool. To be a Gaelic and Australian double, though, I think that takes it to another level. I mean, yes, Mark O'Connor is a county Kerry champion with Dingle, but that's not nearly on the same level. I'm excited also for the 46 on 46 matchup in the Ruck. Yes. Both Cox and McInerney have had excellent final series. Cox did a really nice job on Kieran Briggs this past week, and McInerney kicked a couple goals in the prelim. I would say if I were a betting man, I'd put money on both of them to kick goals in this game. I would do that before doing any sort of money line at all. Collingwood favored by four and a half as we currently look at things. I might just hit Collingwood on the spread. I, I like them on the money line for sure. I'd give them about like an 80% chance of winning this game. Maybe maybe 80 is a little high, but that seems pretty reasonable, yeah? I would say 70. If McStay were it, I'd bump it up a decent amount. That's fair. I do think McStay would be, would be kind of a game breaker, and not having him definitely makes an impact, because he's, even if they're not going to him a ton, you look at what he's done one-on-one -on -one against so many really good defenders. One last thing here, uh... So this will be the third grand final meeting between the Brisbane Lions and Collingwood. But if you do what the AFL doesn't and count Fitzroy as part of the Brisbane Lions history, this will be their equal record seventh grand final matchup. Collingwood and Melbourne also have the record. And oh yeah, are the Collywobbles still alive if the Pies lose this? I would have to say yes. The big talk, you know, of course, is that Collingwood haven't won a premiership in September since 1958. 1990 was delayed by a replay of I think it was a qualifying final against the Eagles. And then 2010, obviously, they had to replay the grand final, which is, I mean, do we like that or not? Do you like the concept of a grand final replay? I get why they aren't doing it anymore. I get why they've done away with it. I think it's an interesting concept. I would definitely not 
allow it in an earlier round, maybe just for the grand final, I would consider doing a replay. I mean, that was what they did from 1991 through 2010, I believe. So what, they had extra time for other finals? Yeah, I believe that's the case. I mean, at some levels, some like reserves and community levels, apparently sometimes instead it's just sudden death. So like Golden Point continuing in the fourth quarter. I honestly wouldn't be opposed to that. I think that might be the better way. So what, you just like don't even stop playing, just keep going? I mean, I feel like play would have to stop. I'm not sure. Yes, when you go back to the middle and then it's just... I, I don't know because it says... I, I don't love that idea because it would just be get one clearance and just immediately fling it at the... Let's take a look. I'm, I'm looking at this article about the 2013 VFL Reserves Grand Final with Williamstown winning by a golden point over Box Hill. Whereas I feel like in a situation where maybe you're, you know, where it's like, you know, sort of soccer style extra time without a golden point, you could try to milk time to make sure that you kick late. And I feel like there's a lot more strategy that comes into that. Yeah, it's only three minutes of extra time now. That was changed in 2020. It was five minutes before two five minute periods. And I think that's only happened three times. I'd probably split it down the middle and do it at four minutes. Well, uh, if we get extra time, it'll mean we get a good grand final. So I'm I'm honestly here for it. And also, the last time we even had extra time, it wasn't after the siren goal. And I don't even know the last time that happened in a grand final, if ever. Not in the AFL or VFL, I would have to say. Yeah. One more thing here before we go. I saw that there's going to be like an, an under-17 game, I think, but as a curtain raiser to the grand final. Team Selwood versus Team Natanui. Love that. Yeah, I mean, neither of them are actually going to be coaching the game. It's going to be... um. Don't love that. Well, they won't be head coaches anyway. It looks like it's going to be Andrew Sturgis, the head coach of the Calder Cannons, coaching Team Natanui, and Mark McVeigh coaching Team Selwood. McVeigh wasn't in any AFL coaching position this year, so nice opportunity for him. Do you want to also put in a, a grand final sprint tip while we're at it? Uh, let me check again who's in it. I just think it's really funny that Ned Moyle is the Suns entry. Like, I just want to, I hope he's just a troll entrance and like, I, I mean, don't know, ends up like crab walking the whole thing. Let's see, I'll go, uh, I don't know, uh, Nick Martin. James Robottom. I'll also say like secondary pick, I could totally see Lockie Schultz or Josh Weddle doing well. If I had a secondary, then, um, fuck it, Holmes. All right. I think that's all the things. Um, I know that the guys from Marmalade are going to be involved in the longest kick competition, which is good. Yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. But uh, I think we've gone on long enough here. We're on Twitter at Americans Footy. YouTube as well. I'm on Twitter at Castle Media. I'm at BenjaminHK01. Brian Harambe's on Instagram at CatThameGrian. He's been sitting up in the windowsill for a while. He's finally calmed down. Yeah, he was not calm during the first half of the recording. Hopefully he enjoys the grand final as well. Thank you.